Um, but hey, we're, we're looking at a text this morning. It's a good text. Uh, we're, it's a text that, that points out something that I think that we've all known, that we've all probably experienced and definitely observed. And it's this idea that there are, there are divisions, and people tend to, I don't know, there are divisions amongst groups of people, right? And there are, people tend to form in groups. And sometimes that's not a bad thing. Um, and it, it is the case of our text this morning. It's actually a really, really bad thing. And as I was just thinking about um, this idea of groups, man, ever since I can remember, there have been groups of people that have formed together, right? I had to go back to elementary school, and uh, there was like, there was like this uh, elite group of geniuses in my class every year that would leave every Wednesday because they were with the gifted and talented program. You know what I'm talking about? Um, there was like three of them, and then you'd be like, and, and we would sit there on Wednesdays and we would learn. Um, because that was what we did at school. We learned. And then you talk to your friends from the gifted and talented program, and you're like, hey, what did you do? And they're like, puzzles. Really? You did puzzles all day? Yeah, and we had a Harry Potter plate we did. Like, what is, like, what? And so, like, and so I'm sitting there learning science, and whatever. They're there, and it's like, and it's kind of the whole gifted and talented program thing is kind of funny um, for a few reasons. One is, like, everyone has a story about how they were, like, they took the gifted and talented test, and they all just missed it by one point. You know who I'm talking about. Like, yeah, I took the test, and I just missed it by one point. Uh, everybody has that story, except for me. No one ever saw me and thought, you know what, let's give Godin the test. <laughs> They're like, no, he's very normal. Let's just leave him with all the normal kids. And even you think about, okay, even think about the idea, like, gifted and talented, okay? What does that say about everyone who's not in there? We're neither gifted nor talented. We are just by ourselves. Um, and it's like this division, right, amongst the group where you're like, okay, there's, there's that. And you, and you see it too. And, and I mean, that's just elementary school. But the truth is that as you get older, there's all kinds of divisions that you see. And, and as we come to our text this morning, it's a text where, where Paul, he acknowledges that there are some divisions in the church. But, and, and, and these divisions are probably far more dangerous than the gifted and talented program. And it's, it's a division that, 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 to be frank, if it's left unchecked, what it will do is it will hinder the gospel's effectiveness moving forward. And, and the groups that were defined here in the church at Ephesus would be the, the Jewish converts to Christianity and the Gentile converts to Christianity. And, and they both ended up at Christianity or at faith in Jesus. But what made it challenging was they both got there in ways that seemed very, very different. And so Paul starts off this portion of our scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, addressing really the Gentiles directly, but he's definitely indirectly addressing the Jewish converts as well. And this is in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, it says this. It says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Like that is a verse that you just want to remember right there. Okay, just hold on to that in your heart. It'll inspire you as you leave. Um, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That he's He's talking to the, and he's really pointing out something to this church. And he's, it's really, it's like, you guys can't get along. He's like, you got the Jewish Christians, you got the Gentile Christians, and you're having a hard time getting along, and you need to figure it out. And the reason why we know that they're having a hard time getting along is really because of verse 11, which is kind of funny, because it's like, Paul's pointing out that they're calling each other names. <laughs> like, and they're like weird names, like, the Gentiles are calling the Jews the circumcision, and the, the Jews are calling the Gentiles the uncircumcision. So if you really want to, like, stick it to someone today, you, circumc you are the circumcision. Like, you, you really, that'll go all New Testament on them. That'll show them. Uh, but, but it's this idea that there, there is this division amongst the church that is very hard for us in our flesh to reconcile. I mean, even if you put yourself in the perspective of a Jewish Christian in Ephesus— that it would be very difficult to come to terms with the fact that there are Gentiles now coming to the same church as you. That, that, that Jewish rabbis wrongly, this is that wrongly, they wrongly taught during that day that, that the only reason why God created Gentiles was to fuel the fires of hell. 
And now they're in the same church, worshiping the same God, having all the same rights and privileges. And then you've got these Gentiles who probably feel some of that. And Paul, in some ways, he leans into it in saying, hey, what I want you to understand is that before Christ, you were very hopeless. And and it's such a thing that I find it really interesting in the text, but that two times Paul tells Gentiles to remember what they were. He's saying, hey, don't, don't forget what you were before you experienced the grace of God. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, one, we're all Gentiles, I'm pretty sure, and so if not, you can tell me afterwards. I'm like, cool, you're not, but I think we all are. And, and, and you know, when you think about it, it's really important that we remember what Christ has done for us. If you've been doing this thing for a while, right, you've probably, you probably don't even think about your life before Christ anymore, do you? Like that was such ancient history that you're like, man, I don't even know what that, what I was, and, and, and I think what Paul like is saying here is there is incredible value in remembering what Christ has done for you. You know, and, and I think there's all kinds of value to it. If you think about the track you were on before Jesus, it should make you feel really good about the track that you're on right now. Hey, man, if he wouldn't have come in and saved me, I would be without hope. But in Christ, you're like, man, I, that's where I was, but I'm not. Even thinking about just this idea of remembering who we were before Christ, it's really powerful because what it does is it, it helps us in how we relate to people who don't know Jesus. That, that if you remember that that is what you were, then you're going to have a hard time looking down on someone who's not where you are yet. That, that Paul is saying, he's saying, don't, don't forget. And it can be hard sometimes because maybe sometimes your past is like littered with shame and, and regret. And, and I would say, don't, like, don't push into that. But Paul is saying, he's saying, don't forget what he has done for you. And, and so he's like, don't forget. And then he, he's like, so don't forget. This is what you were. And then he's like, but this isn't who you are. And let me tell you why. In verse 13, it says this. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you who were once far off were brought near. I mean, I just, I just think of that as the first century. Like, if I'm a first century Gentile Christian reading that, to hear this idea that what God wants for me is to be near to him. Like, I was all of these things. I was separate. But now what he wants is he wants to bring me near. And if you think about the story of Scripture, I mean, that's the story of Scripture. It's that God wants to bring you near. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the book, in the book of Genesis, that God, he created people. And he created people, and, and he didn't just create them so that, like, he could have distance. But what the Scripture says is that there, in the book of Genesis, that God literally walked with people, with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. That God's desire was to like be with the people all the time, and then what happened was sin created separation, and he wasn't able to do that anymore. Then if you go to the New Testament, the beginning of the New Testament, I mean, Jesus has a lot of names. But one of the names he's been given is the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That when God's like, I want to redeem these people, how am I going to do it? I'm going to do it by being with them. And so God comes to be with us so that we can be with him forever. And then if you go to the end of the book, if if you go to the very end, how does the story end? It ends with God and his people together forever. That what God wants, he wants to be near. He wants to be near you. And if you're sitting here as as a Gentile with this story that's been pretty foreign to you, that you can, you'd have this incredible sense of awe where it's like, I cannot believe that this is what God wants me to be included in. And then you see as the text moves forward of how God does it. It's really, really interesting here in, in verse 14, it says this, 
For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That what, he's, what Paul's doing here is he's using language that would have caused the Gentiles and the Jews to be very aware of their differences, but he, he does it in a way to show that though those things might, uh, might have been differences for you, that they're not differences anymore. I mean, if you look at that where it says the dividing wall of hostility, most of the commentators that I read, um, they, they all said that, that this, is, this is talking about the temple. And the temple is where Jews would go to worship. And something, an interesting feature in the temple was that there was a dividing wall, okay? And in the temple, there was a dividing wall. And what the dividing wall did was it separated the Gentiles who came to worship from the Jews who came to worship. And there was like an understanding, okay, that you, if you're a Gentile, you don't cross that wall. There was actually a sign in the temple that said something to the extent of, if you cross this wall and you're from another nation, not the nation of Israel, you are responsible for your own death. Saying, hey, we're going to kill you and it's not your fault. And so what Paul is saying is he's saying, yeah, that might have been the case. But what Jesus came and he did is he knocked that wall down so that we all can approach Jesus in the same way. That what used to be there isn't there anymore. And then he mentions the law, okay? And it's kind of a funny sentence if you think about it because he says abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. And maybe at first glance you could read that and think, so... So we just, like, throw the Old Testament away? Like, is that what he's saying? Like, we don't need that anymore? And, and that's why it's really important to, like, interpret Scripture with Scripture. Because um, Jesus in Matthew 5, he says that he came to fulfill the law. So I don't think that Paul would contradict what Jesus said there. I think even just, like, logically, I think that we would all probably agree that it'd be weird to throw away the Ten Commandments, right? Like, we're like, those are pretty good. I like those, you know? Maybe one of you is like, I don't like one of them. Well, that's between you and God. But like, those are pretty, like, those are like, hey, those are, you know, those are pretty good. So what, so what is he saying then? What is he abolishing? Well, he's abolishing the idea of the law is what makes you right with God. He's saying that's just not how it works. And, and, and with Jews and Gentiles, like, Jews would have thought the law is what makes them right. That's what makes them better is the law. And he's like, no, that isn't, that, that, that's gone. And even he's, I would say that what he's also abolishing is he's abolishing the dividing nature of the law. Of the law. And, and I would use this as an example that I know we're all thinking about right now, which is circumcision. And, and this is kind of how, 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 what they did with circumcision is they would, like circumcision, if you, if you were here with us when we walked through Abraham's story, um, it was something that God gave as a covenant to his people to say, hey, you're my people. That you're my people. Not, not that you're better, but it's like this is a, a distinguishing mark of, of my people. And, it's, and, and what, what it became was it became this like status thing that literally people are calling, them, calling each other names based on whether or not they've had that happen. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, yeah, throw that away. That's not how it works. The, 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 the dividing nature of the law is no more. And so he says that, and so he's, he does that, and then as it goes forward, he, he talks about how he's making two into one. He's saying where there were Gentile and Jew, now there's Christian. And the things that divide, like, you, that's not how it works anymore. That your, your identity is more founded in Christ than it is in the things that you had before Christ. Which, if you, I mean, one time, I think sometimes we wonder, right? Like, it's a miracle that the gospel made it all the way to Springfield, Missouri. 
I mean, it started in the ancient Near East 2,000 years ago. Like, we're in Springfield, and like, we're not the only place in Springfield doing this. Like, that is a miracle. And I think sometimes it's worth asking, like, how did that, how did that happen? I think part of the reason why it happened is because they didn't, Paul didn't just tell them to do this, but they did it. And it is very difficult to argue with the power of that type of message. That where there were Jew and Gentile who did not get along anywhere, but in the, in the, in the church, they are united with the, for a common purpose. How do you deny the reality of what happened there? And so as that was going on, the church continues to thrive. And what you see as Paul finishes up this section is he finishes up by, by really helping us see our purpose. Look at this in, in, verse, in verse 17. It says this, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit and to the Father. I find it really interesting that verse 17, what it's talking about. You, you see that, and you might think, okay, so that was part of what Jesus preached in his ministry. But that's actually not what it's talking Every single commentator I read said that that's not what he's talking about, because peace wouldn't have been accomplished until he rose from the dead. So he couldn't have preached peace until he died on the cross and rose from the dead. And so, like, then what is, what is that talking about? Well, there's, kind of, there's three things that I think most people are in agreement of what verse 17 is talking about. One is that it, it seems to be that that was some of the message that Jesus would have preached after he rose from the dead. Which is kind of interesting because if you think about it, there's not a lot in the Bible about what Jesus said or did after he rose. But one of the things that we can be pretty confident of is that he, he preached peace. Be, beyond that, I think that what's happening here is that, that it's talking about every time the apostles got up and proclaimed the gospel— that Jesus himself was speaking through them as they proclaimed the gospel message, which would mean every time we get up and proclaim the gospel message, that Jesus is speaking through us a message of peace that he's, he's had. And it's, it's a message of, of peace, but then you see in verse 18 that it's, there's this unity that's there that he's calling people to by pointing out the unity of the Trinity. But if you notice that he mentions the Spirit and the Father, and we've been brought to him by the Son. And there's this subtle thing that, he, that Paul is doing here where he's saying God is in relationship with himself. And if God is in relationship with himself, and he's a God who cares about relationships, then then you should be in relationship with other people too. And so that's our, that's our text. And so then the question is, okay, so what do we do with it? And, I, I, and really, I, I would say big picture, this is a, a text that communicates who Jesus is. And there are three things that we see that Jesus is from this text, I think, that we can take home this morning. And the first is this. Jesus is an includer. That Jesus is an includer. Um, I don't know, the, the idea of like feeling left out, right, is one that no one likes. It doesn't matter if you're a kid, it doesn't matter if you're an adult, like the idea of not being included in a group, man, it is a hard thing to have. To, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, it, it, like this happened recently. I've mentioned before that, um, that we have contractors in our building all the time. <laughs> I think Thursday was the first time that there wasn't a contractor in there since like February, okay? And, um, and like, I'll be like, there are group divisions. Um, the contractors are cool. And we all kind of want them to be our friends because they're just, like, cooler than we are, you know? Like, they carry a hammer. We work on a computer. Like, it just, you know, there's just something. To, like, they can do stuff that we can't. Like, we're like, we all, and so like, there's this sense where we're like, we really want to be friends with these people, okay? And so um, numerous times we've invited them to lunch. And every time they say no... And then you're like, you see him eating a sandwich in their car, and you're like, okay, uh, I guess we know where we stand. Um, it, but then one time, okay, one time I come back from an appointment that I was at, and I'm like, where's Ashley and Z? And they're like, oh, he's at lunch with Bryce, who's like our GC. 
And I was like, what? <laughs> like, Bryce? And I'm like, and then I'm like, so, so no one thought to text me to go to lunch with Bryce? He's cool. He has a hammer. Like, what do you mean? And then it's like, you think about it, there's like a, like a dividing cool, like the, the cool kids on the staff now. So it's like Ashley and Z are the cool kids. And there's everyone else who doesn't get to go to lunch with Bryce. And, and, and there's like this sense here, right? Where it's like, man, it stinks to be left out. And, and here's what you see Jesus do is that Jesus is like, that's not what I do. That what I do is, is I want to make a way for everyone to be included. And you really, you see that in verse 12. Look at this. He says, remember that you were, that you were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of the promise, that you, you had no hope, and you were without God in this world. That, that Paul's saying, he's saying, that's what you were, but it's not what you are that you were those things, but now you are included. That, that Jesus, he's an includer. He includes us. And I think that we have to be really aware of the fact that all of us, and I think that Jesus knows that we long to be included. And that's why he wants to include us. But we have to be aware of that because the truth is that the, the church and Jesus isn't the only, the only thing offering inclusion. But the world's offering inclusion. And we have to be so careful not to accept that at the expense of accepting the inclusion that comes through Jesus. It's not to say that we shouldn't have groups, that we shouldn't be involved with other people, but I think we have to see those things for what they are. That, that if you think about inclusion with the world, that it is, as much as we might think that it's otherwise, that it is, there's nothing, there's no guarantee in inclusion in the world. And it's because it's based on people, and people are fickle. But I'm sure some of you can probably think of, like, groups of friends that you were in, and now you're not. And maybe it's because you said something out of character, and you ruined it, or maybe it's because someone else said something out of character, and they ruined it. And it's really hard, right? Because you're like, I used to be included, and now I'm not. You see them, you're still friends on Facebook, so you see all the things they do without you, and it's just really hard, and it hurts, right? That what, what Paul is saying is saying that Jesus is an includer, and his inclusion is stronger than anything that this world can offer. And the reason why it's so strong is because what it's based on. And, and you see what it's based on here in the text in verse 13. It says, you've been brought near, or you can say, you have been included by the blood of Christ that the reason why you can be brought near, the reason why you have been included is because of the blood that was shed for your sins. And the beauty of that means the price has already been paid. That's not going to be taken away. It's done. It's over. He did it. It's yours. So long as you want it, he will include you in his family that all the things that he gives, he gives to you. And so what does, this, what does this mean for us? Well, I think, one, the idea of Jesus being included is really important because I would, just, I would know that there are people in this room and you feel left out all the time. Right? It's hard for you. You, you think about people and you, just, you feel like you're not included. You feel like you're, you're the person who's always left out. You, you see all this stuff and you're like, what's, even maybe to an extent where you're like, what's wrong with me? Well, here's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus includes you. And not only does he include you, but there will come a day where his inclusion is the only thing that matters. And in the moments in your life when maybe you feel like, I don't know, you're having a hard time because of what you're not a part of, that the beauty of the gospel is that is something that you can press into and know that even though I'm left out of this, he has brought me in. And there will come a day where that'll be the only thing that matters and that'll be the only thing you want to be included with. And so you can, it, 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 it can give you some hope and some security in those moments in this life when we feel left out. But also what this says is if Jesus was an includer, then that means that we should be includers too. 
That, that, that what this text should do is it should cause us to look at our lives, look at how we are socially, and, and ask a very difficult question, do I include people? Like, like do, am I mindful of other people? A, am I trying to bring people into the fold, or am I pushing people out of the fold? Because the truth is, man, that what we have in Christ is incredibly powerful, incredibly important, and we need to do everything that we can to make sure that we are bringing people in. And gosh, wouldn't it be a bad testimony if people would say about us, I would love to get to know them better, but they don't want to include me. So Jesus is an includer we should be too. The second thing is this is that Jesus, he's not just an includer, but he's also a peacemaker. That Jesus is a, he's a peacemaker, which is probably good because it's one thing to be included. Um, and it'd be, it's kind of horrible to be included in a place where there's no peace, right? Like, is it, oh, cool, I get to come and, oh, you asked me to join your fight. That's awesome. Okay, so that's what this is. All right, awesome. And you're like, oh, you should know the church. Uh, it's not, yeah, but, but he's like, Jesus, he comes in, he includes you, and he brings peace. And this is the way Paul says, he says, for he himself is our peace, for he has made us both one. Now, this is a Gentile Jewish text that they're looking at each other, that it's talking to both of them. And what you're seeing here is you're saying that the Jesus, he brings peace in places that otherwise will, where division will be. Or he brings peace to places where there's division over things that, is, that, are, things that are not sinful, okay? Like, if there's, like, sinful things, like, you, sh- like you, should, you don't want unity over those things. Like, that will, there will be division. There will be challenges. Like, you will, you're not going to agree, and that's going to be challenging. But there are also places where there's division over things that are not inherently sinful, and what the gospel does is like, I'm, I'm going to come into those places and I'm going to bring peace to those places. Just to use an example. So I graduated from Ozark, class of 04. And, uh, and one of the things, I don't know if this is true anymore, um, but man, when I was in high school, we hated Nixa. Gosh, we hated Nixa. Um, and I, was, I did this, and I was a Christian when I did this, so I was immature, but I was, I was saved. Um, and I remember, because we hated Nixa, me and my group of, group of my friends, um, we went to a Nixa-Ozark football game, and it was in Nixa. And me and my friends, we thought it would be really, really funny to stand behind Nixa's, like, section where they would sit. And every time Ozark did something good, uh, we would cheer really loudly, which is super annoying to the people from Nixa. Um, and so we did that for about a half, and, and then what ended up happening was a police officer came and escorted us out of the game. Um, we didn't even get a warning, which I'm like, eh, I think we could have gotten a warning maybe, but we didn't. We got kicked out. And, and, here, and like, here's the thing. Like, there were, and it was, it was, I think it was playful or whatever, but maybe it was, it was still stupid. Um, but like, there were kids in my youth group who played for Nix's team. Like, I didn't be like, you can't sit in my row. You're from Nixa. Like, I didn't do that. Like, there were, I mean, even there were people probably in the, in, the, in the section, like, there was Ozark, Nixon. And here's the thing, there's nothing inherently sinful about being from Ozark. There's nothing inherently sinful about being from Nixa. It, and so, like, what Christ does, he comes in those places where there might be cultural differences, and he brings peace. That other places where you can't get along, where naturally there's going to be opposition and fighting, well, in the church, that isn't how it works. And Paul, Paul says it this way in Galatians, and I think it's, it's really pointed and powerful. And he says it this way in Galatians 3. He says, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. But what he's saying is he's saying those cultural lines that exist everywhere else, they don't exist in the church. But they shouldn't exist in the church. It doesn't mean that you stop being those cultural things that you are. It just means that you shouldn't let those things divide you. I like the way that Lynn Kohick says it in her commentary on, on Ephesians. She says it this way, Unity necessitates that differences remain. Otherwise, one has not unity but sameness. And unity, it's a byproduct of peace. 
And so if you're in places that are supposed to be Christian and there's not peace, the question worth asking is, is why? And really for us, the question worth asking is, are we people that bring peace into situations? If Jesus was a peacemaker and we're supposed to be like him, then that means that we should be people of peace. So what that means is if you're that person, and I, and I, and I, I say you're that person, like I'm that person, and I have to work on this, where like you sit there and you nurse that grudge, and you feel this incredible power of just going over that in your mind. That's not peace. And I'd be very careful if you're not only the person that nurses the grudge, but you bring other people on your team as you nurse the grudge. Well, that, that, that definitely is not peace. That, that it's worth asking, like, are there things about people that aren't sinful, but that for whatever reason, I don't, want to, like, I don't like them because of that? Well, Paul's saying here, you, Jesus is a peacemaker. We should be peacemakers too. Are there cultural traditions that we are more committed to than we're committed to the gospel? And if that's the case, Paul's saying, Jesus was a peacemaker, and you've got to figure that out and bring peace too. And so he brings, what Jesus does, he brings into social things, he brings peace, but not only does he do that, but more importantly what Jesus does, he gives us peace with God. And you see that in verse 14 where it says, he himself is our peace. There's this idea where it's like, you, you will not find peace with God outside of Jesus Christ. There's no way to find peace with God outside of Jesus Christ. That what he came to do is he came to bring peace so that you could have peace with God. And really you see that in the third thing that Jesus is in our text. And it's that Jesus is a gate breaker. That where there are gates, where there are walls, where there are things that are meant to divide and keep us out, what Jesus does is Jesus breaks those things down and makes a way. I like the way that John Stott says it in his commentary. He says that the slain has become the slayer. That he comes and breaks things that would get in the way of us experiencing God to the fullest. That's why Paul finishes this letter by saying, for through him we, we both have access to the Spirit, or in one Spirit, to the Father. But Jesus has come to give us access to God so that we can have peace. Maybe I, you think of it this way. I, in our old neighborhood, we used to live in, we used to live in Nix, actually. Um, and our neighborhood was interesting because it was three neighborhoods that were all touching together, touching each other. You didn't know where one stopped and the other began, but you knew there were three different neighborhoods. And there was one neighborhood that was like the nice one, okay? And that wasn't the one we lived in. And, um, and what, I think what made it nice was that it had this really nice pond, it was really nice. Like it was really pretty. Um, as a family, we'd walk there all the time and just kind of look at the pond. And, and I was told that it was stocked with fish. Um, so people would come and they'd fish. They enjoyed this pond. And there, there came a point where the people who lived there in that neighborhood, uh, they got frustrated with the amount of people that were coming and enjoying their pond. And so they actually put signs up, really nice metal signs up around the pond that said, this pond is only for residents of whatever the name of the neighborhood was. And one time, as our family, we were just, we were walking around the pond and someone actually stopped us and asked us where we lived um, because they were serious. They, this is their pond. And, and the idea there is, okay, this thing that we have, it's so good that if too many people start taking advantage of it, it's going to ruin it. And so that's why they put up a sign, because they didn't want people to ruin the good thing that they had. Well, Jesus does the exact opposite. Wherever there might be a barrier, something keeping you from experiencing the good things that God has for you, he comes and he breaks it down. He does it by including you. He, he does it by making peace, and then he breaks anything. He's willing to break anything down to get in the way, so much so that if there is distance between you and God, no one can say it's because of you or because of him. It's because of you. 
And so really what this text forces us to ask ourselves is, is there distance? And if there is, then what do I need to do to rectify it? Let's pray. God, we love you. We're thankful, God, for who you are. God, that you're a gate breaker. You're a peacemaker. God, that you're an includer. Even us, God, we, for those of us who are here and we're in Christ, our story is such that we were once far off and you brought us near. God, thank you that you thought we were worthy of being included. Thank you, God, that you, that you were, thought we were worth making peace with. And that, God, you, you eliminated the barriers. And I just pray, God, that in turn we would be people who are includers. God, that we'd be people who are peacemakers and that we wouldn't create walls to keep people from experiencing you. But God, I also just pray, I wonder if maybe there are people here and the reality of their circumstances, there is distance between them and God. So much so that if they were to be honest about where they are spiritually, that they would say they're not right with you. Jesus, I pray they hear what I'm saying. God, that that doesn't have to be the case because Jesus made a way. And I pray, God, that they would respond in faith and put their trust in you and that you would show them in this moment how they can be different because of what you did for them. And so, Jesus, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you so much for checking us out online today. We hope it was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. And if you would like to give today, there are two ways you can do so. You can text your amount to 84321 or you can go to giving.nlspringfield.com. Also, if you are new here, we have Party with the Pastors the first week of each month. We would love to see you there. We get to know you better and you get to know us a little better too. And also we have services every Sunday at 8, 9, 30, and 11. And we'd love to see you in person. We will see you next week.